What is up, everybody? Mr. Pertis here. Welcome to Unit 6 of the Modern World, Part 2. Part 2 on the revolutions in the Cold War. This is Section B, which is on revolutions or reforms in communist countries. Um, coming back to the Chinese and Russian revolutions that happened um, specifically in 1918 for Russia and 1946-ish for China. Uh, this is a whole thing is again, it's modern world, 1900s present. Just a little quick review um, in case you were a little confused in the last video or um, need a little refresher on communism. Communism is from the previous time period. Uh, it, the idea of it at least came in the mid 1800s. It was written by a guy named the original theory by Karl Marx and a guy named Friedrich Engels. And Marx and Engels wrote in this theory of communism that the working conditions in factories would get so bad that the workers would rise up and overthrow the owners and essentially create a society where everyone was equal. It would be a violent revolution. And um, no one in Western Europe, this comes about in Western Europe, these ideas, and it kind of gets a little bit of traction, but most people don't turn towards it because the government reforms things and fixes the working conditions um, in order to protect workers. So we see the beginning of these reforms in Western Europe. The irony of this is these this revolution, the first two countries that are going to see these communist revolutions really take hold are Russia and China, two countries that really aren't even industrialized. Um, and the focus of in a lot of ways, especially in China and to a certain degree in Russia, is we're going to try and bring peasants into this revolution. So China is not even close to being industrialized and they have a communist revolution, which really doesn't make sense if you think about it, because Marx is about workers overthrowing owners. But in China, Mao focuses on the peasants. And in Russia or the Soviet Union, they focus to a certain degree on the workers, but they also are trying to do the same thing with the peasants as well. So a little bit of irony there. Um, you would think that the communist revolution would be in a fully industrialized country, but it's not. So with that said, um, let's get going here and let's do some of the stuff that some of these changes and reforms that are going to be done in these communist countries. So let's start with this in the Soviet Union. I remember our leader of the Bolsheviks who starts this communist revolution and the leader of the Soviet Union is Vladimir Lenin. Uh, unfortunately for Vladimir Lenin, he dies in 1924. He had a couple strokes, um, which is uh, an issue with blood in the brain and a whole bunch of stuff. And he actually He's really sick for two years, uh, almost to the point of paralysis and uh, really not healthy and good. And he is going to die in 1924. This is his real body. His body is still on display. If you ever go to Russia and you can go visit it, I believe it's in Moscow and you can see his body. Um, it's in a glass case and you can see it. This is him. He dies in 1924. Before his death, he actually... Uh, writes a letter to the members of the Communist Party saying essentially, don't let Joseph Stalin, who's this guy down here, don't let him become the leader of the Soviet Union. I don't trust him. He's not a good guy. He's going to, he's power hungry. Um, if he becomes leader, it, who knows what's going to happen? Um, don't let him become leader. And he writes this letter to the Communist Party for this, that, and the other reason. The letter never officially gets put out there to the Communist Party. Um, and when he dies, there's really kind of two options. This guy, Leon Trotsky, this is kind of Lenin's boy. He was the leader of the military, um, both during the revolution and during what, a period of the Civil War, which is after between World War One and World War, um, or the, between World War One and Lenin's death. There's a civil war in Russia between the communists and the non-communists. And this is the guy who's the leader. He looks like a nutty professor, but he's actually the leader of the military. And the other person who they are thinking maybe will take over after Lenin dies is Joseph Stalin. Stalin is the secretary of the Communist Party, meaning that he controls who gets hired, who gets fired. He kind of organizes stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. He is – Stalin is going to actually win this struggle for power. Even though Lenin did not want him to be the leader, uh, Stalin gets control of the Communist Party, of the Bolsheviks, and becomes the leader of the Soviet Union. In the After he becomes leader, he kind of kicks Trotsky out of the party. Trotsky is going to move to Mexico um, where he's going to live out the rest of his life until he wakes up one morning with an ice pick through his eye, killing him um, from two Communist Party uh, – spies who are working for Stalin who assassinate Trotsky. So Trotsky's going to die in Mexico. Um, a couple of things here. So we have Stalin's going to take over in the Soviet Union. We have Mao Zedong, who is the leader of China. So Stalin and Mao, just a couple similarities. Number one is these are both what we would call totalitarians. 
So let me say it again. Totalitarians. Hitler was a totalitarian. We have a lot of totalitarians in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Stalin is a totalitarian. Mao is a totalitarian. And to be a totalitarian means you have total control. You control everything. It is almost identical to an absolute monarch, except you aren't a king. Your power does not get passed on to your children. You control all aspects of life. And a couple similarities we see with Stalin and we see with Mao with being a totalitarian is they both ban religion. Religion and communism it usually don't go hand in hand. In fact, Karl Marx called religion the opiate of the masses. Basically means it's like a drug. It keeps you from busting out of your bubble and thinking great thoughts because you're focused on what God or, God or the gods want you to do. So in order to follow Karl Marx's playbook, essentially, Stalin and Mao both ban religion. If you get rid of religion, this is a, this is not literally, this is a figurative example here, but if you get rid of religion, you get rid of God. God no longer exists in people's minds. And if you get rid of God, if you are Stalin, people don't answer any longer to God or their priests or their bishops or their popes, they instead answer to Stalin. And Stalin becomes the head of all things, both earthly and heavenly, essentially. Um, also, Mao Zedong is also going to essentially ban Confucianism. We have this, is, this turns China on its head. If you think about it, we've had Confucianism in China um, since predating the Han Dynasty back during the classical period. And now we're getting rid of it. We're getting rid of Confucian scholars. We're getting rid of all that stuff, including in Buddhism and Taoism and all the other religions that have popped up. It's gone, which is a pretty significant deal. So religion is going to be banned. Also, both of these guys are going to be focused on eliminating their opponents. They're kind of a little bit what we would call paranoid. They're constantly worried that people are trying to overthrow them. And Stalin and Mao are both going to be focused on how do we eliminate people. Um, Stalin is going to, in what are called the great purges, like the purge, they, he actually puts trials together for people who helped lead the Russian Revolution, friends of his, um, guys who are on his side, he essentially turns against because he's worried that they're going to try and overthrow him. So he turns against these people and puts them on trial for crimes of treason to try and kill him. Um, this is a famous quote of Stalin. Death is the solution to all problems. No man, no problems. Uh, and this is a quote from Mao. When there is not enough to eat, people starve to death. It is better to let half of the people die so that the other half can eat their fill. So he's kind of like... These dudes are no joke. They're constantly trying to eliminate opponents um, and they are have total control over their people. So another thing that both this is a big slide. So just kind of zone like zoom in here. So I want to start up here. So both of these guys are going to control their national economies. These are not laissez faire hands off free market guys. They are the opposite. They are command economy people. They have full control over their economy. They decide what's produced, how much of it's produced, and what people can buy. They are fully under control. Both of these guys realize their countries are behind. They're not industrialized. Russia's not fully industrialized, aka the Soviet Union. When Mao takes over, China's not industrialized. The self-strengthening movement, if you remember from the previous time period synthesis, is not, didn't work. So China and Russia need to industrialize if they want to play the game. So Russia and China are going to be focused on full rapid industrialization. The Chinese and the Russians are going to have command economies under these two totalitarians. So we have Stalin in the USSR. His plan to industrialize is what is called a five-year plan because it is five years. There's actually two five-year plans, but let's just give them, we'll combine them here. His five-year plan, basically he sets quotas in factories. So he says, hey, iron factory people, um, you last year made a hundred million metric tons, I don't even know if that's right, of iron. This year, in the next five years, I would like for you to increase it to 500, metric ton, 500 million metric tons of iron. If you do it, congratulations. If you don't do it, um, you will be punished. We'll come and we'll find out who's not working hard enough. His men might come and do an investigation after a year to see how they're maintaining, come to the factory owner and say, hey, why didn't you make more? And factory owner's like, hey, that kid over there isn't working hard enough. And then these guys might arrest that person and you might never see that person ever again. So there's a lot of intimidation here, a lot of threatening here, a lot of I need to work really hard because it's the best for me so I don't get arrested and it's also the best for the country so we industrialize. A quota is when you set 
Um, if you've never heard that term before, it's when you set a certain goal. Um, an example here would be like, if I said to you, whoever's watching this, you need to have a hundred in all of your classes next year. And if you don't have a hundred in all of your classes next year, um, you're going to be arrested. You might not actually get a hundred in all your classes, but you'll probably work a little bit harder. And that would be a quota. That hundred would be the quota. Also, Stalin in this five-year plan limits consumer goods. It's not about buying ties or buying shirts um, or buying water bottles. It is about focusing the factories on heavy industry. So we're going to focus on coal, iron, electricity, um, all those things that are part of an industrialized country. So less on consumer goods. We're not we don't we're not going to produce textiles as much in the factory. It's about heavy machines. As Mao, who Stalin does this plan in 1928, before World War II, Mao doesn't come to power until after World War II. So Mao is going to use a lot of Stalin's ideas. So he also has a five-year plan. He's going to ask, when Mao takes over, he's going to ask Stalin to help invest in China and help them to industrialize. They're also going to invest in mining and infrastructure, which is infrastructure is in the news a lot today. It's about roads. It's about building highways. It's about bridges. It's the things that help the country move and trade and on a day-to-day -day basis. Also, we're going to see the iron, steel, these things of heavy industry. So there's also going to be a focus on heavy industry. A lot of China is focused on urban and urbanization. It's these urban advancements. It's infrastructure in urban areas. It really helps out people in city areas. So these two things are very similar in how to industrialize. Also for farms, because you need farm goods to produce in order to feed your workers and you have to improve your agriculture. Um, peasants are going to be forced to work communally on the land. So remember, when Lenin took over, he promised the peasants land. He gives them land. Stalin comes in and he's like, this really isn't working. These poor peasants who are working these little plots of land isn't producing enough food. So what Stalin does is he, after the peasants had gotten their land and they're like, sweet, dude, you gave us our own land. We got our land for 10 years. Stalin's like, just kidding, bro, and takes the land away and says, you don't own your land anymore. You and all of your neighbors who own their own little plots of land will now work one big farm together as a community. You will collectively work this farm. I will give you a modern machine, a tractor or something like that to work this huge plot of land, but you and your neighbors and your other neighbors and your other neighbors will now work the land together. And peasants don't like this because one, they're mad they got their land taken away, and two, they are upset because their neighbor doesn't work as hard as them. Just like in group work, you know, oh, someone's always slacking. So same kind of thing. This is a total failure. It's a bust. Um, a lot of peasants are mad about it. They kind of take back stuff. They, they sneak food. They don't give everything away. Um, it's going to lead to a kind of a famine in a couple areas. Uh, also, in Mao's China, they do create communes. Because it's later, he kind of learns from some of the problems of Stalin. Basically, he says in each commune, there's 5,000 families. They work the land together. They have to give up all of their possessions, their possessions. Again, communism is supposed to be about people being equal and not owning things. Everyone owns things together. So all 5,000 of these families have um, one, all their possessions kind of come together into one big pot, essentially. Um, on each commune, there's a school. There's free health care provided. There's military protection. Um, you bring government officials who come and observe the commune and make sure things are running smoothly. This is also a failure. People, peasants supported Mao because he promised them land. Now he's taking land away. No one wants to lose their land. Land is key to everything. Um, so it's going to be a problem. So Mao and Stalin both kind of fail in this, but especially Stalin, more so Stalin, this industrialization totally works. The Soviet Union becomes an industrialized power before World War II. China, not so much. This doesn't really focus, work because a lot of the communes don't produce enough food to help out the workers. So a little bit of a difference there. Also, one last thing, communism is about equality. Let's not forget of the, the women. They are 50% of the population in the Soviet Union. A couple things that women are going to be given the right to do under communism. One, right to choose who they marry and divorce, including choosing your surname, which is your last name. Um, in the United States, stereotypically, women take males, their husband's last name. Um, kind of a little sexist, just saying. Um, and in this case, you're allowed to choose your surname. Kind of cool. Um, jobs are going to be open up to women to work in factories. Also, more educational opportunities. Um, women are going to be able to go to college and post-college and become doctors and all that good stuff. Um, also, we're going to see legalized birth control. So if you want, if you're a working woman um, and you're married, but you don't want to have kids because you're focused on your career, the government does provide birth control for you. Um, also in China, the right to choose who they marry and divorce. 
which is really a big deal if you think back in Chinese history. Really, up until through a lot of Confucianism, many girls didn't even get a name, let alone choose who you marry. They were called first daughter, second daughter, third daughter. Now you actually get to choose who you marry, choose who you divorce. Divorce is a big deal, especially if you're um, being um, abused by your husband, your husband's cheating on you. Um, now you have the right to file for divorce. Also, um, in terms of work, men and women are seen as equal. Um, Women are not supposed to be given lower jobs or lower pay. Um, also, children were provided with daycare, which allows women to work. Um, they're also, Mao is going to formally outlaw foot binding. It had been outlawed in the early 1900s towards the end of the Qing dynasty, um, but they are going to formally outlaw it. So it is banned within China. Um, also, women can own and sell property. And here's the deal. All these things are great, but China has been like a very strict patriarchy for 3,000 years. It's hard to suddenly just make everyone equal. There's a lot of ingrained stuff in, in individuals' minds about patriarchy and about women's roles. So to suddenly get rid of it, both within men and women's minds, is really kind of difficult. But Mao is really trying to create this idea of communism where everyone is fully equal. One kind of last thing on this. Both these guys, these totalitarians, are very... Um, responsible for numbers and numbers of deaths. And Stalin's reign is pretty much, he's in charge from 1924 till he dies. And then what I believe 1952. Um, and he's individually responsible or his policies are responsible for the deaths of between 32 and about 48 to 50 million people. So that's kind of the low end and the high end. Um, the Great Leap Forward, which is the name of Mao's five-year plan, is responsible, and the collectives, a total, he's responsible for the death of about 30 million to about 45 million people. So Stalin and Mao combined, even on a low estimate, are responsible for the death of 60 million people, um, pretty much between 1924 and Mao when he comes out of power and dies in 1978. So that's 60 million people who probably wouldn't have died had the, the circumstances not. By comparison to the Holocaust, we have about 11 million People who die in the Holocaust, um, World War II here is about 40 million to maybe 62 million. And there's World War One. So kind of a crazy numbers here just to put in perspective. That's what I got. Um, some bad stuff. Some totalitarians. Hope you enjoyed it. As always, if you've got any questions, let me know. Be good.